And as they're heading out the door, if you would have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 18 as we continue our study through, verse by verse, through the Gospel of John. We started last year and we're nearing the conclusion. We'll be looking at a pretty big passage today, John 18 through 18, 28 through 19, 16. Also wanted to let you know that over the next four or five weeks as we finish out the book of John. We have put together some more study guides. Several people are asking for some, oh good, Uh, asking for some study guides. I figure as we get to the crucifixion and resurrection of our Savior, uh, what a good time to be in God's Word on a daily basis. So these are out in the foyer. They'll be available through the end of the book of John. They're a five-day study. Highly encourage you to do this, just to allow God's Word to just penetrate your heart and just encourage you each day. And I know I've had a few people tell me this has become such a helpful thing for them on a daily basis and has actually changed their perspective as they begin the day by doing the study each morning. And so these are available out there. You can also get them online, but encourage you to do that. Again, remember the flow of John. We looked at the first 12 chapters of John really deal with his public ministry to the nation. And he is rejected by his own nation. Then in John 13 through 17, we deal with this private ministry with the disciples. And of course, I call John 17 the Holy of Holies because we are getting a glimpse into this communion and conversation between Father and Son in the Trinity. Uh, But Josh is right. You know, it's hard to say that's the Holy of Holies. Then you get to John 18 through 21. Well, what is that? Well, that's the entrance into the Holy of Holies. In other words, the reason that we can celebrate in John 17 and have a glimpse of our high priest sitting at the right hand of God interceding for us is because of the work that he does for us in John 18 through 21. It's by the blood of the Lamb that we have access into the Holy of Holies. And so you really go from public ministry to the nation, private ministry to his disciples, to now what I call the universal ministry of Christ because his death is a death for the sins of all mankind, his resurrection is the hope of all mankind because he bore our sins and our death and conquered both. And so we're going to be moving into that today. Uh, It's called Behold the Man. There's actually a famous painting. There's actually many paintings called Ecce Homo, which is the Latin word for Behold the Man. This is perhaps one of the most famous. Antonio Cesare uh, painted this. What made it unique, it was because of the perspective Most of the paintings were in front uh, where you're looking up at Pilate presenting Jesus. This was a painting from behind. And they say the reason he did this is because he took the perspective of a slave. (laughs) This is how a slave that day would have seen what was going on, a Roman slave. He was not in the front with the Roman soldiers, with the Roman leaders. He was not in the crowd with the Jewish uh, religious leaders. He was in the background. And in many ways, he was a Roman slave who was watching those events. I thought of that when I read this by Fleming Rutledge. Jesus' situation under the harsh judgment of Rome was analogous to our situation under sin. He was condemned. He was rendered helpless and powerless. He was stripped of his humanity. He was reduced to the status of a beast and declared unfit to live and deserving of a death proper to slaves. Crucifixion was known as the slave's death because no Roman citizen would go through it. It was illegal for a Roman citizen to be crucified. It was only a death worthy of slaves. And what, according to Paul, were we if not slaves? This is what happened on the cross. The Son of God gave himself to be enslaved by sin, condemned by the law, and subject to death. Thus, he entered into our desperate condition. So when Pilate says, Behold the man... Uh, That word man is anthropos. He's really saying, behold the man, the one who represents us all. He didn't have any idea what he was saying. But for us, we need to behold the man because he is God in the flesh. He is the true image of God. He is the true reflection of what we should be. But he is the one to restore that image in us, bears our sin and our shame and our wounds, so that we could be then changed into his image through his death and resurrection. And so as we look at this, behold the man, we're all Roman slaves in some sense, or we're all slaves looking from the background at what Jesus Christ has done for us. Before we read the passage, let me just have a word of prayer. And of course, I'm also going to pray. I'm sure many of you have been watching the news and realize that a massive 
hurricane is uh, heading towards Florida, really heading towards the Bahamas. Uh, it's category five, which is a, uh, as big as they get. And so we just need to pray that God would continue to turn that storm and keep it from areas of population and just pray for those people because we all know we can identify <laughs> and I can imagine with a category five heading our way what that would be doing for us so we need to pray for those people as well and so let's pray father we thank you that you're a goddess of sovereignty and you are in control and everything we have is a gift of your grace and we thank you for the passage today that reminds us of the extent of your love that your son jesus entered into human flesh and lived on this earth, and then suffered death, and not just any death, but death on the cross. And there's something about the cursedness and forsakenness and cruelty and depravity and pain of the cross that reminds us of how far in the depths humanity has fallen and how far in the depths you're willing to go to save us. Thank you for that love. May we behold your Son this morning and worship Him. Father, deliver us from distractions, deliver us from the things that keep our heart from hearing your word, and may your spirit have free reign this morning. We do pray for the people in the Bahamas and people in the other islands and those in Florida and along the coast of Georgia and South Carolina as they are watching this storm today, and I'm sure there is fear and uncertainty. We just pray, first of all, that you remove this storm out into the ocean where it does not affect life. And Father, that you'd give peace, that you would strengthen churches that are in the path of the storm or nearby to minister both during the storm and afterwards. But Father, we just trust you and pray that you'd preserve life and that you would cause this storm to again remind us how fragile life is and how much we need a hope that's a sure foundation from any storm. <clears throat> so Father, we put this in your hands and trust you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you ready? John 18. Hopefully you have your Bible open. If not, there may be one in front of you. We're going to go from John 18, 28 all the way down to 19, 16. I may make a few comments along the way. But just again, behold your Savior. Behold the man. Remember, this is a, I gave you a chronology on your outline. Uh, Jesus already had three religious trials. He went before Annas, then he went before Caiaphas, then Luke says he also went before the full Sanhedrin. He's already had three trials. All of them were illegal and basically unjust. Now he's going to basically have three civil trials. He's going to be before Pilate. Then Luke says Pilate sends him to Herod trying to get out of the situation. Herod sends him back to Pilate, so he has another uh, trial with Pilate again. So there's going to be six trials that he goes through, but John's only going to give us a glimpse of some of them. But let's read John 18:28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Not only was prophecy that he was going to die, prophecy also said he was going to die a death that would be a cursed death, and that would have to be being hung on a cross. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself on this, or did others tell you this about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And I would underline verse 37. It tells you the reason Christ was born, not only born, but why he came into the world, implying pre existence. So he was born, pre existence came into the world. Why? To bear witness to the truth, to tell us what reality truly was, and that he truly is the king. Here's Pilate's response Pilate said to him, What is 
truth, a classic postmodern response to our culture today. What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom, I should release someone to you at Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Interestingly, Barabbas, his name means son of the father, or son of the priest. And Matthew says his name was Jesus, uh, or Yeshua Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas. Interesting, they rejected Jesus the Messiah for Jesus Barabbas. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. The soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you, that you may know I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was even the more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, in about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him to, be, to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. A lot to cover in that, but you see the trial, you see the rejection of Christ. You really see a clash between, in fact, that's what we're going to look at a little bit later. You see a clash between the religious world, the political or secular world, and the kingdom of Christ. And I think that same clash happens all the time in every culture, and particularly in our own. And so we're going to be looking at that clash a little later. I did want to clear up two issues of chronology. If you read John, the implication is that they have not celebrated Passover yet. Did you pick that up? If you look at uh, verse 28, they didn't want to be defiled that they might eat the Passover. And then later on in chapter 19, he says uh, that it was the preparation day of the Passover in about the sixth hour. It does create some challenges, and people have sort of debated, did, uh, was it Passover or was it not? Now, Passover was the first day of this first feast that Israel celebrated on the Psalm 14. Then it was followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasted for seven days. Some people will combine those together, those eight days, and just call it Passover. So some people think he's just using general terms and saying Passover, referring to this whole eight-day feast. But remember, John's pretty exact, and and Pastor Josh said that last uh, week. He is so exact that if he's going to do something, he generally has a purpose for it. And there is a theory that's fairly well established that there were actually two days of Passover during that time. Uh, If you look at uh, this chart, you basically see that depending on the way you look at how a day goes, that the Galileans saw a day beginning at 6 a.m. and ending at 6 a.m., where the Judeans saw the day beginning at 6 p.m. and ending at 6 p.m. And there's, there's several pieces of evidence that show that Galileans and Judeans looked at time differently and they calculated their days differently. And there's evidence that during this time period, Passover was actually celebrated on two consecutive days. Galileans would have celebrated, in this case, on Thursday night at 6. Judeans would have celebrated on Friday there almost at 6 o'clock, right there between the twilights is when the Passover was supposed to be uh, partaken. Uh, They argued about which was correct, but over time they just accepted it. Why did they accept it? 
because during this time period, there were close to a million to possibly two million people that came to Jerusalem for Passover. Can you imagine this small city with an influx of a million or two million people? Josephus, a very reliable Jewish historian, says 256,000 Passover lambs were killed and slaughtered during these days. It would almost be impossible to slaughter 256,000 lambs in one afternoon. And so they almost just allowed it to be two days because that allowed them to actually perform the Passover sacrifice. So I tend to take this theory. And so Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples. The next day, all the Judeans, these religious leaders, had not yet celebrated. They were going to celebrate it that night, and therefore they did not want to defile themselves beforehand. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that Jesus, or John, says that he was uh, declared to be guilty and about to be crucified. It was about noon. Uh, you might remember what Mark says at what time it was when Jesus was condemned and about to be crucified. 9 a.m., the third hour. So some people say maybe John is using Roman time. Roman time began at midnight. They had a whole different time schedule. It was very confusing back then. But no one had watches, so no one really cared, I guess. But everybody had different ways of uh, organizing the days. The Romans actually started the day at midnight like we do. Uh, so it's possible that John is saying it was about 6 in the morning when Pilate finally condemned him. Then that leaves three hours of prep for the crucifixion, which is a long time, but it's possible. It also means there was a whole lot of stuff that took place before 6 a.m. that we see in John 19 and the other Gospels. Another possibility is, I don't know if you can read this or not, but basically the way they did time back then, again, remember they don't have watches, they don't have smartphones, they don't have alarms to tell them what time it is. It's based on, really on the position of the sun. And they basically had four watches during the night and four segments of time during the day. They would call it sunrise, then third hour, then sixth hour, then ninth hour. And so it's possible that they're just using approximate times. When Mark says it's, a, it's about the third hour, about 9 a.m., he's saying it's sometime between that 9 a.m. to 12 noon block. And when John says it's about the sixth hour, he's talking about it sometime before that 12 time noon, which could anywhere from technically 9 to 12 o'clock. Why would John want to make sure we see that it's about noon? Um, because what starts at noontime in the temple courts if Passover is about to start? That's when they start slaughtering the lambs. And so if there were two Passovers, and on that day that Jesus was crucified was also a Passover day, what John is saying is the very moment that he is condemned to be crucified, he says, and it was about noon. It was almost time for the Passover lambs to be slaughtered. And he is pointing ahead. Notice that when he says it's about noon, he also says it was preparation for the Passover. He wants to link those in our mind because what he wants you to see is they're about to go off and slaughter some lambs that cannot do anything to deal with their situation. A symbol of uh, the shedding of blood for the um, aversion of God's judgment. And yet here they are about to crucify the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Think about it. These religious leaders who want to so quickly get him on the cross then are going to rush over to the temple and start slaughtering Passover lambs. Meanwhile, outside the city gates, the Passover lamb for all mankind is on the cross, condemned by their own religion and their own pride. What's also interesting, if you, you play this out, that means Caiaphas, the high priest, was probably getting ready to put on his robes to take the blood into the Holy of Holies when Christ died and the veil was split from top to bottom. You think Caiaphas would have remembered that one? <laughs> Here's the man about to go in. He's a corrupt man, has no inkling of any spiritual desire. He's just doing this to go through the motions and suddenly the whole darkness while they're, they're uh, slaughtering the lambs, the whole land is dark, there's an earthquake, and then as he's possibly about to head into the Holy of Holies, the whole veil splits in half. And so John is signaling us, this is the true Passover lamb who is about to die for us. So, with those out of the way, I want to show you this clash, and so I want to show you a, a short clip from the Passion of the Christ. Now, I know Passion of Christ is intense and 
some of it's a little uh, overdone and, and reflects some theology we wouldn't necessarily agree with. But I will give Mel Cripson, Gibson credit for this. He probably captures the bu- brutality of the cross and of the scourging better than anyone else. Um, if we would have been there, we would have thrown up. We are so sanitized. Now, what I'm going to show you is not the scourging, and it's not to that degree, but I want to show you this initial interview with Pilate, and I want to show you this initial uh, with the religious leaders demanding him to be crucified, and then I want to talk about this clash between politics, religion, and the kingdom of God. Mentre ficcerette volt. Cool. Quit fecisti. Rex is tu? Veni meum non este hoc mundo. Si eset. Putas ministri mei isto sic tradre mei. Si fissant. Ant malca. Ergo Rex is tu. Ego an hoc natus sum. Testimonium veritati per ebeam. Amnes qui veritatem audiunt. Voce meam audiunt. Veritas. Quid est veritas? Diam anachna nacharsim beit esuri. Ratsekai edia, baraba. Castigatio severa sit abonader, sed non isinere eos eon uccidere. I think as you watch that, you capture sort of the emotions of what's going on that day. And again, you see the clash of the religious realm and the political realm and the kingdom of Christ that has entered into that realm. So if you look at the back of your outline, I want to talk about the three realms in which we can trust. And I would say all of us have put our trust in one of these realms. Um, We either put our trust and our hope in a religious realm, possibly put it in a political realm, or our hope and trust is fully in the kingdom of Christ. What I want to do is I want to just look, make some observations. That, uh, we look at this earthly realm of religion. Uh, what are some things that we can observe as we read this passage? Uh, the first thing you can observe is this, that this religious realm had a love of laws, but had absolutely no love. I don't know if you noticed, but throughout this passage, he talked about the law. Uh, we need to judge them according to our law, and it's not lawful for us to put anyone Uh, to death. And we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. This is a group that loved laws. (laughs) They loved the rules. And if you go back to Jesus' ministry throughout the Gospels, what's interesting is this theme of lawfulness is almost what all the controversies around Jesus are all about. I listed some of those passages, and you can go back and look at them, but here's a few of them. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? 
But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. So the very pieces that they used to uh, bribe uh, Judas to betray the Son of Man, they say, oh, we can't accept that. It's not lawful for us to have it. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? You think they love the, the law? <laughs> but what part of the law had they totally missed? They missed everything, really, because they had uh, added so many regulations and rules to the law. They basically made it just a large legalistic uh, thing that no one could, could uh, obey. But here's what Jesus said. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out of that and swallow a camel. And I will tell you, religion will do that. <laughs> religion will come up with so many laws and rules, and it's all about making sure you do all the laws and the rules right, but you don't see the fruit of the Spirit, and you don't definitely see a, an obeying of the great commandment. And think about it. Here are the Jews talking about what is lawful, and they're about to crucify the one who not only wrote the law, <laughs> but the one who exemplified the very meaning of the law, was the one that they wanted to get rid of because their hearts were not right before God. I think a second thing you see is that he had a focus on the external rather than the internal and the eternal. It's hard to ignore verse 28. They've just had three illegal trials where they accused Jesus. They're finally bringing him to Pilate, and they don't want to enter into Pilate's praetorium because they don't want to defile themselves. <laughs> They haven't even thought through all the things they have done up to this point that already showed the condition of their heart. But what it does show is that in religion, we focus so much on the outside, we forget the condition of our own heart. That's why Jesus said many people wash the outside of the cup. Meanwhile, the inside is filled with immorality and hypocrisy and rebellion against God. It does make me ask the question. It's so easy for us to get caught up in the religious realm I wonder if we were to evaluate how much time we spend making our outward man look good or outward person look good to present ourselves well to the society around us, if we compared that to how much time I spend dealing with the inner part of my heart and my character. And when I prepare for worship, is all of my preparation just to make sure I look nice is, or is my preparation to be humble before the Lord and say, God, there is a bunch of junk in here I'm not even aware of. As I enter worship today, please, may my heart be open to your spirit and may the word speak to my heart. And if there's a message for me to hear, Father, please help it to penetrate deep into my heart to change me into the image of my Savior. How easy it is to get caught up in the religion, isn't it? And we go through the motions and we do the things that make us look good on the outside, but there's something wrong with our heart when our focus is on that instead of on our heart. And I think the third thing you see with these religious leaders is a profession of love, but a commitment to their own selfish agenda. Uh, they are acting like that they are following the law and that they are protecting their religion, but what they're actually doing is just protecting their own selfish agenda. Uh, that's probably exemplified in the fact they call for Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, it says in my version, he was a robber. Uh, the Greek has a word for robber, kleptes. Anybody know where we get kleptes, what we have with kleptes? Kleptomaniac, yeah. A kleptes is a thief that comes into your house at night and steals stuff when you're not there. That's not the word used here. The word used here is lestes. Lestes is a robber, but he's not a robber that sneaks in your house. He's the one that mugs you on the side of the road. He's the one that plunders you openly. He is basically a thug. He's a gang member. And they basically chose him because he at least had tried to be an in, uh, start an insurrection against the Romans. So in their mind, you know what? Uh, he's not necessarily who we want, but at least he's got the right enemy that he's trying to attack. And we'd rather have Barabbas than have Jesus the Messiah. Which again tells me how many times we really say we're worshiping Jesus, but we really have a false Messiah. We want a Jesus that caters to our own agenda. We do not want one that confronts and challenges us and changes our heart. We want a Jesus that fixes our external circumstances and makes them all better. We don't want a Jesus that confronts us 
with the selfishness of our heart and says, I need to repent. <laughs> we love false messiahs, and they had one as well. How does religion work? Religion works basically like this. Um, the, the etymology of the word religion is debated, but I think it has the idea of a bound contract. Not a covenant, but a contract. And it's basically a contract that we give God on our behalf. And basically we give God this contract and we say, God, I'm going to do my part. If I go to church, do good things, give money, don't curse, don't murder anybody, then you owe me a good life. Um, how many times do we think that? Well, I've been living a good life. Why am I going through tough times? When we say that, what are we saying? God, you owe me. I've been doing good stuff. You really owe me. You owe to make my life easy. Bless me with things. Owe me good health. Owe me long life. Owe me heaven. I will say this very clearly. If your thought on what gets you into heaven has anything to do with what nice things you've done and how good you are compared to the neighbors and the coworkers you have and the fact that you've gone to church and you've done some good church things, you have no idea what salvation is all about. And you are deceived. Salvation has nothing to do with what you have done. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ has done. Because the only thing we deserve, according to scriptures, is death. For the wages of sin is death. Which means anything we have, every good gift we have, the blessing of heaven and the hope of eternal life is a total 100% gift of grace. Totally undeserved. And if religion is still in your mind and you think, wait a second, I've done all these good things and God owes me something, you do not understand your condition and the incredible grace of God. And His purpose for you is not to make your life comfortable. His purpose for you is to transform you into the image of His Son. Which means, you know how He does that sometimes? <laughs> he gives you something you don't want in your life. He gives you a thorn in the flesh. He gives you difficulty. He gives you an irritating neighbor. He gives you somebody that's going to stretch you. Why? Because the issue is to change your heart and to teach you what it means to reflect the life of Christ. And so don't get caught up in the realm of religion. As you see here, this, this religious society is totally condemned because they condemned the Son of God. Let's look at the political realm. What do we learn about Pontius Pilate? What's your impression of Pontius Pilate just from this segment of scripture strong leader <laughs> he didn't like the Jews he hated the Jews but he feared them at the same time because the emperor Tiberius for some reason had this strange affinity for the Jews and so he wanted them to keep things he wanted Pilate to keep things in order but he didn't want to do anything that would somehow harm the Jews and anytime Pilate did something like that the Jews would send a letter to Tiberius and Tiberius would give him a stern rebuke so Pilate Hated Tiberius, but he also feared Tiberius. Three things I think you can learn about Pontius Pilate in this passage. One, he has no truth. <laughs> no real truth. Uh, isn't it interesting? Pilate has become a cynic. What is a cynic? It's someone that thinks that life is so messed up and people are so selfish and greedy and self-centered that no one really knows the truth. He had played the political game for so long, he didn't think truth existed. Uh, I have an article here, I'm not going to read through it, but it's called Lying Liars, How Science Has Proven That Politicians Lie More Than Other People. <laughs> um, and it, it includes a famous joke that many of us have probably heard, how do you know a politician is lying? Because his mouth is moving, that's right. Uh, people that get into politics you need to pray for them because they get into such a world where the truth is massaged and manipulated and truth almost becomes a tool, a manipulative tool to get what I want. And if I need to stretch the truth to get this policy passed, I'll stretch the truth to get this policy passed. And unfortunately, I think Pilate had played this game for so long when Jesus talked about testifying to the truth, he had become so uh, skewed by the world he's in, all he could do with almost disdain say, what is truth? Are you so naive that you think there's actually still truth? What's amazing is truth was embodied right in front of him. <laughs> so the issue for Pilate was not the availability of truth. It was available. The issue with Pilate was the stubborn depravity of his own heart. Truth is available. Oftentimes we simply don't want to hear it. We would rather not hear it. In fact, let's be honest, sometimes we'd rather people lie to us than to actually confront us with the truth and the condition of our heart. That's why people don't like Scripture, because it does not 
uh, shade anything when it comes to exposing the condition of our heart. So he has no truth. He has no power. Isn't it interesting a statement? Uh, Jesus, I have power to release you or crucify you. Did he have that power? Technically he did, but if he did have that power, he could have released him a long time ago. But he didn't do it. Notice what it says in uh, verse 8 of chapter 19. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. What does that imply? He's been afraid this whole time. Behind all of this acting like he's got things under control, there was this string of fear. And then when he heard that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, that fear just elevated in his heart. And he had no idea what he was dealing with. He had no power. Uh, he had a position, but he had no power. And any power he had was a gift of God's grace. And finally, he had no justice. Did you catch how many times Pilate said, I find no fault in him? Three times he says, I find no fault in him. And then finally, when he condemns Jesus, John doesn't record it. But what does he do? He tries to wash his hands of the whole affair. Which says that here's a man that was appointed to uphold justice. And there is no justice. I would say we, live, we are people who long for justice, but we live in a world where it simply does not, that simply does not offer it. The innocent are often condemned. The guilty often go free. And even when the guilty are condemned and punished, it still doesn't end the sorrow and the loss of the victims they leave behind. We long for a world where wrongs are made right, where every loss is restored, where peace and truth finally reign, and where life never ends. And you're not going to find that in religion, and you're not going to find it in the political world. And I know we live in a society where we have a voice, and we should use it with every ounce of our being. We actually are a part of the government, and we should speak as we have opportunity. But how do you know if you put your hope in politics? Here's some questions. Do I panic at every election? Do I focus more on politics than on the power of the gospel? And am I willing to overlook a politician's lies and sins as long as he keeps meeting my own agenda? If so, then I'm saying politics is where my hope is. And that's where I want to put my faith. And what you see in this passage is if that's where you put your faith, either in the political realm or in the religious realm, they both will fail you. Because they will not answer the questions that are the real need of our hearts or the condition of society. They may make it a little bit more comfortable for a little longer, but they cannot deal with sin. They cannot deal with death. That's why we need another king. <laughs> Religion, what it's all about, manipulating God for my own agenda. God's a means to my end. What is politics? Politics is manipulating whatever human power I can have for my own agenda. At the heart of both of them is self. And what you're seeing is the kingdom of Christ comes into contact with both of those. And what do both of those do? They reject. <laughs> they condemn. They look at the kingdom and they look at Christ as the king and they reject him. And in their rejection, they do something that actually fulfills prophecy. Because in their rejection of the king, they actually behold the man. They behold the Lamb of God. Why is he... If you look in the Gospel of John, three times we're told to behold Jesus. And three times there's three titles given to him and we're told to behold Jesus. The first time we're told to behold... Or here we're told to behold the man. Why? Because he's the perfect high priest, the perfect representative that we need. He represents us. He is the... Last Adam. He is the one who restores what we lost in Adam. He is the man, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But how does John introduce Jesus in chapter 1? Not only behold the man, but behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you realize that when he went to the cross, he became sin for us? <laughs> everything you have ever done, everything you have ever thought, Every wound that you have received because of the sin of others, all of your sorrow, all of your iniquity, all of your shame, all of your guilt, all of your condemnation was placed upon Jesus Christ. He not only bore our sin, he bore our shame. He bore every wound. 
that we receive because of the depravity of man in this world. He bore it all. That's why it says, by his stripes or by his wounds, we are healed. You can live in your woundedness or you can begin to live in the wholeness of Christ. Because he bore that on the cross for you. Behold the man who's the perfect representation of who we should be. Who we should be. Behold the lamb, the one who died in your place. So he could remake you and transform you into his image. And then behold the king. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that Pilate says behold the king. And he almost did it probably in a mocking way. And yet, that was the king of the universe. The one who is coming to reign on this earth. Believer, behold your king. <laughs> he loves you so much that he entered your world and he died in your place to give you eternal life. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He says, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. Fallen man is a rebel who must lay down his arms. And it's only those who recognize the love of God shown in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who in humility recognize their need and receive that gift, that receive eternal life from the one who can give life, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Father, it's so easy to get caught up in this world we live in, and there are so many impressive realms in which we can live but father help us not to lose sight of the fact that you are the king and father your kingdom is coming and may we our hope and our focus be on that kingdom father as we celebrate communion i don't know the condition of the hearts here but if someone's never trusted in christ i pray they would stop trusting in religion or in pride or comparing themselves to other people but recognize they desperately need a savior and may they embrace Jesus Christ as their Savior this morning. Confess Him. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Receive Him this morning. And then declare that to others as a confirmation of what they believed in their heart. And Father, for the rest of us, may we behold the man. We've heard this story so many times. But Father, it is in beholding the grace and holiness and justice and mercy that was exhibited on the cross that reminds us that every day we live in the grace of God. We live in your grace. And we should allow your grace to transform us more and more into the image of your Son. May we yield to you today and thank you for your grace. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.